Let's just pray before I start. Heavenly Father, uh, thank you so much that you are here today. Thank you that I know that I'm not alone here at front, but you are with me. Please, please be with everyone here today with their own troubles, their own thoughts, their own difficulties in life. Father, help them to hear your word today. Help them to hear you talk into their ear so that they can know you are alive. Bless me. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Um, when, when I went to Arise, uh, it wasn't long, even in the first two, three weeks, people start asking me, oh, how's Arise, how's Arise? And, 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 and they say, what is the best thing so far that you've heard at Arise? And honestly, I didn't know what to say. <laughs> uh, I had to think about it a little bit. Um, and in my short little life, I have learned that if you talk too much, you can get into trouble. <laughs> um, especially if it comes to, to things that is personal and deep and... and so bear with me today if I'm trying to, to share a little bit of what God has done for me in this three and a half months of Arise. Um, there are two things that stood out for me um, while I was there. Uh, I went to Arise... Um, because I wanted to see God. I had to see, I needed to see God in my life. So I went there um, with expectations. Uh, Arise gave me three and a half months of, uh, of just focusing on that. Uh, and the wonderful thing or the, the, the good thing for me was how God pushed my buttons. Now, I had more than one button. <laughs> uh, I had boxes under my bed with feelings and emotions and experiences that was better not to touch. It is amazing to see how God touched those boxes. <laughs> it, it, it was amazing to me to go through the process where, where I can see how God changes my life and do things for me. Um, now, door knocking, as I've said, is not, it's not easy for me. It, it was a big challenge for me. I went there and I knew that we had to go door knocking and, and I wasn't comfortable about it. And we started with it and I quickly realized that I cannot do this thing by myself. Um, it's one thing to sit on your bed in the morning and have a devotional life and feel blessed and... and um, I think, man, this was beautiful, or to sit in a church and get a blessing. But it's another thing to knock on someone's door and say, I want to tell you what God has done for me in my life. It's, uh, connection with God all of a sudden gets a different meaning. Uh, and that brings me to the second point which is that um, I was amazed to experience that connection with God. It, just to give you a few examples, we met a lady, um, we had a little girl, and she was prepared to talk to us because she wanted the little girl to know 
the Bible stories. And obviously, she didn't. So um, they invited us back on an appointment, and I had to go back and thought, what am I going to tell this little kid in such a way that, uh, that I can also talk to the grandma at the same time. So what stories will I tell? And uh, you know, you talk to your friends and to other people and someone said, oh, talk about uh, the prodigal son. I thought, well, it sounds good. <laughs> so I started thinking about the prodigal son and what it means and the lessons in it. And the interesting thing is I never gave that Bible study. I never told the story. There was always something that... Uh, they were sick or not there or this or the other. But God used that thoughts, and you will see in the rest of my sermon, to go somewhere. There was another lady by the name of Lone. Um, she was very open and she said, challenge me, challenge me with anything. Um, but her mind was like way out on, on everything under the sun, like angels and visions and new age and... And I went home there, from there, and I thought, God, what on earth am I going to say? How do I... Uh, connection with God changes, and prayer changes when you have to pray specific for someone else. Now, I have prayed for other people many times in my life, but somehow it's different. It's different if you don't know what to do, and, and God has to tell you what to do. Um, the first study with loan, I prepared, and, and, but it was completely different. <laughs> it, never, it never goes where you think it will go. But we had a, a long conversation, and, and we talked about things, and I went home feeling very, very blessed. Um, the problem with this sort of a thing is that the devil is there too, isn't it? Um, and the devil knows where my buttons is too. And while I was there on this high, the devil started pushing my buttons too. And he started kicking those boxes under the bed. So uh, I could feel myself going down and down. It's funny how quickly your mind changes if it goes from God to yourself. Uh, when you focus on God, what do I need to know and do to help this person? And all of a sudden you start thinking about the things that I've done and, and the things that I struggle with and, and, and I, how can I do this thing and and it goes down and down. And it was a Thursday afternoon. Um, Jacob and I, Jacob was my outreach partner, we met a young boy, he was a grown man, mid-twenties, and uh, he said, specifically, he said, I'm not interested in religion. He said, it doesn't sit right with me. He said, that's his exact words. He said, religion doesn't sit right with me because I'm sick of looking for God and looking for God and looking for God and God never looks for me. And we talked to him and, and I remember I, I quoted John 3.16 and we tried to tell him about the love of God and, and all these things, but... I went home from there. He invited us back. Jacob, because Jacob was more his age group, gave him three Bible studies after that. But um, I went home and I thought to myself, Richard, that is exactly where you are. I, I'm, I'm looking for God and I'm looking for God. Uh, that is exactly where I am. And you know... Um, Remember, this now happens while the devil has got me by the short and curlies. Uh, what is the color of cream soda? Beg your pardon? 
Cream soda is not red. Cream soda is green. You can Google it. I Google it because it's important to me. I don't know why the Aussies made cream soda red. Uh, tan. And apparently some countries made it yellow. I mean, think of it. Yellow cream soda. Cream soda is a green, <laughs> sparkly, <laughs> fizzy drink. The reason why it's important to me was, is when I was in year nine, I had a girlfriend. Don't laugh. It's not funny. <laughs> I had a girlfriend. And uh, she loved cream soda. Cream soda and chocolate. Uh, so what I did is some nights I wait until my parents sleep, or I think they sleep, then I jumped through the window, I ran to the shop, I bought cream soda and chocolate, and then I ran to her house. Knock on the window, she would open the window and I would give her cream soda and chocolate. And we would stand and talk. Uh, nonsense, uh, for a while, and then I ran home again, crawled through my bedroom window, went to bed, as happy as Larry, whoever Larry was. <laughs> but one night when I came home, running happily down the street, my father was waiting for me in the middle of the street. And I don't know about you, but I grew up in an age where there was something like punishment. My father had a long cane that he could bend like that. And he knew how to use it. And I knew that I'm going to pay dearly for that cream soda and chocolate. What can you do now? There's my dad, here I am, so I stop in front of him, and I expect what is to be expected. But my dad didn't hit me. My dad just looked at me, and he said, Richard, I'm so disappointed in you. I don't even want to talk to you. And he turned around and he walked away. Okay, so I crawled through my window, and the next day my dad didn't talk to me, and the next day he didn't talk to me, my dad didn't talk to me. I don't know exactly how long it went on, but more than a week. In the end, my mom came to me and she said, Richard, you better go sort this out with your dad, it can't go on like this. So I went to dad, I can't remember what I said, but all right, he talked to me again. Um, at that time, I didn't think much about it. I thought, well, I deserved it. I did disappoint him. I crawled through the window, I shouldn't have done it, I deserved it. Uh, and I thought it's a, it's a good way for my dad to show me that I've done the wrong thing. Uh, but it messed with my head. Even as a young adult, I thought Dad did the right thing, but it messed with how I looked at things. For a young boy to go to his father and convince him that it's a good thing for him to talk to me. Now, it was a Thursday night back at Arise. And it was a Thursday when we met the guy, the cook, the young guy. So the Friday night I was sitting on my bed 
And I was a million miles away from God. I, uh, the devil was in my ear. And he was telling me all sorts of things. And I felt, I felt lost. I felt deserted. I felt forsaken. And there was no way that I could get through to God. I tried to pray. It doesn't work. Um, It got so desperate, well, I got so desperate that I took a list. They gave us a list of uh, promises there at Arise, and I started reading the list from the top, just text by text by text. Um, one of the texts I remember, Isaiah, Lockie, if you can throw that up, please. Um, Isaiah 44, verse 21 and 22. It says, Remember these, O Jacob. And you know how they tell us to put your name in, to make it personal. I've put my name in there. And Israel, you are my servant. I have formed you. You are my servant. O Israel, you will not be forgotten by me. I have blotted out like a thick cloud your transgressions. And a cloud your sins. Return to me, for I have redeemed you. There was a thick cloud over my head. And it helped a little bit, these, this text and other texts. But I went to bed with a heavy heart. I, uh, the next morning, Sabbath morning, um, I went for my walk on the beach. And that is amazing at a rise. Kingscliff is on the beach. Our house was seven minutes from the beach. So I walk down to the beach and I do my morning walk. And it was beautiful. The sun was coming up. And, and, and I was talking to God. I was thinking about these things and I was praying and talking to God. And the thought came into my mind. Specifically, it says to me, Richard, what did Jesus say when he was on the cross? My God, my God, why have thou forsaken me? And God did forsake Jesus. God did. He turned his face the other way and he said, I cannot look at you. Why? Why? Jesus was rejected in my place so that I can know I am loved and accepted. The cross gives me the assurance that never, never, never ever will God turn his back on me. Jesus experienced that rejection in my place. Jesus was rejected so that God never ever has to separate himself from me again. You know, that thought, that thought that someone from up there came down to the beach to whisper in the ear of a struggling sinner was so special. It was so special to me, more, much more than the principle itself. The principle was liberating. But that thought that God somehow came down here to me, knowing that He cares so much about me that, that He would whisper in my ear, I don't know how to explain or how to express what it meant to me. Romans 8, 35, 39 says, What will separate us from the love of God? Nothing. And he names a few things. Not even death will separate us from the love of God through Jesus Christ on the cross. 
Now, this time I was a fair bit smaller. Um, I don't know exactly, but we had visitors and uh, our kids played in the street. Uh, the kids always played in the street when I was young. And there were more than one couple visiting us, so there was lots of kids. And we were in the streets having fun and playing games. And my parents and, and the other adults were in the house talking their talks. And, and, and we were having a big time in the street. Now, it ended up we playing this game where you knock on someone's door and then you hide. You run away and you hide. And on goes the lights and people open the door and nobody... Have they played... Do they play the game here in Aussie too? I guess today they'll put you in jail for it. But then it was big fun. Man, we had a great time. And uh, after... They close the door, and they put the lights down. Off we go to the next house. And knock on the door, run away and hide. Now, I assume that some of the bigger kids must have thought to themselves, this is getting a bit boring. Because someone picked up a rock and threw it on the roof. Twa, 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 because all the houses then had tin roofs. So on goes the lights, out comes the person, and we run like rats. Man, big fun. We were having a ball. And then when everything quiets down, on to the next house. Bang, rock on the roof. And I don't know if this guy picked up a bigger rock than his little arm could handle, or if he slipped, or if he just didn't have his angle right, but... It went straight through the big window in front of the house. You could hear the glass shatter everywhere. And all of a sudden, it was not fun anymore. We knew that the game was over. And we ran as fast as we could. The guy, on came the lights, this guy came out, and he was not stopping. He was on a roll. Now, I don't know... How my dad heard it, I don't know how he got there so quick. But the next thing I knew that was my father was between us and the cranky guy. Um, I don't know what they said. Frankly, I didn't care what they said. I just knew that my father was there. I was behind him, and that no one will touch me. Now, there's no doubt that I have played the game of sin in the streets of life. And you may have been in a different street, but you were there too. Playing games and having fun. But when the cranky guy comes out to get you, all of a sudden it's not fun anymore. Then the only safe place, which I have lost on my papers, but the only safe place is behind the grace of God. That is the time when you want Jesus to talk to the devil. What happened at the cross, I don't understand. Sometimes they say you must, you must think about it the hour a day. Or, and when I think about it, I think to myself, I don't understand this. The details. And the, but one thing I know, that when I am behind the cross... No one can touch me. Colossians 1.22, Loki. Um, now this is a text out of the message. And I know the message is not our uh, preferred uh, study Bible, but Eugene Pierce has put it so nice. It says, but now, by giving 
himself completely at the cross, actually dying for you, Christ brought out or brought you out over to God's side and put your lives together. God is putting your life together, whole and holy in his presence. Next one, looking. Verse 23. You don't walk away from a gift like that. You don't walk away from a gift like that. You stay grounded and steady in that bond of trust, constantly turned into the message, careful not to be distracted and diverted. There is no other message. There is no other message. Just this one. Just this one. Every creature under heaven gets this one. Now I am bitten by the snake. I told the story this morning about the snakes in the desert. I am bitten by the snake and my whole system is full of poison. But I have decided, come hell or high water, I am going to look at the snake. I want to live and I want life abundantly. I want to live and I want life abundantly. Never in my life again do I want to bear anywhere other than behind the cross. Never ever again do I want to be without that connection. And I have to tell you how much he loves you too. It is not fair not to tell you how good it is to hear the voice of God. Isaiah 53 verse 3 says, He was despised. Next one, Lockie. Thank you. He was despised and rejected by men. A man of sorrow and acquainted with grief. We turned our backs on him and ignored him as if he had no value. It wasn't God that turned his back on us. We turned our backs on him and ignored him as if what he has done for us on the cross had no value. He was despised and we took no pity on him. And then in verse 7 it says, Yet he bore it without saying a thing. Still, somehow, somehow that morning on the beach, I heard God's voice in my ear. And you, if you want to, you can hear it too. I challenge you today, I invite you, I beg of you, look at Jesus. Look at Jesus and he will push your buttons too. If you want to recommit your life to God the way I did, all you have to do is look at the cross. And you will hear his voice. I invite you, if you feel that you want to recommit your life to God, please stand with me this morning as I close with prayer. <laughs> Heavenly Father, Father, thank you so much that we can know that never, ever, ever in our lives, it doesn't matter what we do, 
how much sin we have in our lives, what we've done before, it doesn't matter. You love us. You will never turn your life on your back on us. And if we keep on looking at you, you will change us. And you will bring us home where sin is no more. Father, be with me. Be with every one of us here today. Father, the time to go home is near. Bless us, change us, give us not just a new skin, Father, but give us a new life, a new heart. In Jesus' name I pray this. Amen.